Section 10. Europe and the Faith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Europe and the Faith by Hilaire Belloc. Section 10. Chapter 2. Concluded. St. Ignatius, talking about the origin and present character of the Catholic Church, is exactly in the position, in the matter of dates, of a man of our time talking about the rise and present character of the Socialists, or of the rise and present character of Leopold's Kingdom of Belgium, of United Italy, the modern. He is talking of what is virtually his own time. Well, there comes after this considerable body of contemporary documentary evidence, evidence contemporary, that is, with the very spring and rising of the Church, and proceeding from its first founders, a gap which is somewhat more than the long lifetime of a man. This gap is with difficulty bridged. The vast mass of its documentary evidence has, of course, perished, as has the vast mass of all ancient writing. The little preserved is mainly preserved in quotations and fragments. But after this gap, from somewhat before the year 200, we come to the beginning of a regular series, and a series increasing of volume, of documentary evidence. Not, I repeat, of evidence to the truth of supernatural doctrines, but of evidence to what these doctrines and their accompanying ritual and organization were, evidence to the way in which the Church was constituted, to the way in which she regarded her mission, to the things she thought important, to the practice of her rights. That is why I have taken the early third century as the moment in which we can first take a full historical view of the Catholic Church in being, and this picture is full of evidence to the state of the Church in its origins three generations before. I say again, it is all important for the reader who desires the true historical picture, to seize the sequence of the dates with which we are dealing, their relation to the length of human life, and therefore to the society to which they relate. It is all important because the false history which has had its own way for so many years is based upon two false suggestions of the first magnitude. The first is the suggestion that the period between the crucifixion and the full church of the third century was one in which vast changes could proceed unobserved, and vast perversions of the original ideas be rapidly developed. The second is that the space of time during which those changes are supposed to have taken place was sufficient to account for them. It is only because those days are remote from ours that such suggestions can be made. If we put ourselves by an effort of the imagination into the surroundings of that period, we can soon discover how false these suggestions are. The period was not one favorable to the interruption of record. It was one of a very high culture. The proportion of curious, intellectual, and skeptical men which that society contained was perhaps greater than in any other period with which we are acquainted. It was certainly greater than it is today. Those times were certainly less susceptible to mere novel assertion than are the crowds of our great cities under the influence of the modern press. It was a period astonishingly alive. Lethargy and decay had not yet touched the world of the empire. It built, read, traveled, discussed, and above all criticized with an enormous energy. In general, it was no period during which alien fashions could rise within such a community as the church without their opponents being immediately able to combat them by an appeal to the evidence of the immediate past. The world in which the church arose was one, and that world was intensely vivid. Anyone in that world who saw such an institution as Episcopacy, for instance, or such a doctrine as the divinity of Christ, to be a novel corruption of the originals, could have and would have protested at once. It was a world of ample record and continual communication. Granted such a world, 
Let us take the second point and see what was the distance in mere time between this early third century of which I speak and what is called the apostolic period. That is the generation which could still remember the origins of the church in Jerusalem and the preaching of the gospel in Grecian, Italian, and perhaps African cities. We are often told that changes gradually crept in, that the imperceptible effect of time did this or that. Let us see how these vague phrases stand the test of confrontation with actual dates. Let us stand in the year 200 to 210. Consider a man that advanced in years, well-read and traveled, and present in those first years of the third century at the celebration of the Eucharist. There were many such men who, if they had been able to do so, would have reproved novelties and denounced perverted tradition. That none did so is a sufficient proof that the main lines of Catholic government and practice had developed unbroken and unwarped from at least his own childhood. But an old man who so witnessed the constitution of the Church and its practices, as I have described them in the year 200, would correspond to that generation of old people whom we have with us today. The old people who were born in the late twenties or thirties of the nineteenth century. The old people who can just remember the English Reform Bill and who were almost grown up during the troubles of 1848 and the establishment of the Second Empire in Paris. The old people in the United States who can remember as children the election of Van Buren to the office of President. The old people whose birth was not far removed from the death of Thomas Jefferson, and who were grown men and women when gold was first discovered in California. Well, pursuing that parallel, consider next the persecution under Nero. It was the great event to which the Christians would refer as a date in the early history of the Church. It took place in apostolic times. It affected men who, though aged, could easily remember Judea in the years connected with our Lord's mission and his passion. St. Peter lived to witness in that persecution to the faith. St. John survived it. It came not forty years later than the day of Pentecost. But the persecution under Nero was to an old man, such as I have supposed, assisting at the Eucharist in the early part of the third century, no further off than the Declaration of Independence is from the old people of our generation. An old man in the year 200 could certainly remember many who had themselves been witnesses of the apostolic aid, just as an old man today remembers well men who saw the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. The old people who had surrounded his childhood would be to St. Paul, St. Peter, and St. John, what the old people who survived, say, to 1845, would have been to Jefferson, to Lafayette, or to the younger Pitt. They could have seen and talked to that first generation of the Church, as the corresponding people surviving in the early 19th century could have seen and talked with the founders of the United States. It is quite impossible to imagine that the Eucharistic sacrifice, the rite of initiation, baptism in the name of the Trinity, the establishment of an episcopacy, the fierce defense of unity and orthodoxy, and all those main lines of Catholicism which we find to be the very essence of the Church in the early third century, could have risen without protest. They cannot have come from innocent, natural, uncivilized perversion of an original so very recent and so open to every form of examination. That there should have been discussion as to the definition and meaning of undecided doctrines is natural, and fits with both dates and with the atmosphere of the period and the character of the subject. But that a whole scheme of Christian government and doctrine should have been developed in contradiction of Christian origins, and yet without protest in a period so brilliantly living, full of such rapid intercommunication, and above all so brief, is quite impossible. That is what history has to say of the early church in the Roman Empire. The Gospels, the Acts, the canonical epistles, and those of Clement and Ignatius may tell a true or a false story. 
their authors may have written under an illusion or from a conscious self-deception or they may have been supremely true and immutably sincere but they are contemporary a man may respect their divine origin or he may despise their claims to instruct the human race but that the christian body from its beginning was not christianity but a church and that church was identically one with what was already called long before the third century the catholic church is simply plain history as plain and as straightforward as the history let us say of municipal institutions in contemporary gaul it is history indefinitely better proved and therefore indefinitely more certain than let us say modern guesswork on imaginary teutonic institutions before the eighth century or the still more imaginary aryan origins of the european race or any other of the pseudo-scientific hypotheses which still try to pass for historical truth. Footnote. The Muratorian fragment is older than the 3rd century, and St. Ignatius, who also uses the word Catholic, was as near to the time of the Gospels as I am to the Crimean War. So much for the Catholic Church in the early 3rd century when first we have a mass of evidence upon it. It is a highly disciplined, powerful, growing body, intent on unity, ruled by bishops, having for its central doctrine the incarnation of God in an historical person, Jesus Christ, and for its central right, a mystery, the transformation of bread and wine by priests into the body and blood which the faithful consume. This state within the states, by the year 200, already had affected the empire. In the next generation it permeated the empire. It was already transforming European civilization. By the year 200 the thing was done. As the empire declined, the Catholic Church caught and preserved it. What was the process of that decline? To answer such a question, we have next to observe three developments that followed. The great increase of barbarian hired soldiery within the empire, the weakening of the central power as compared with the local power of the small and increasingly rich class of great landowners, the rise of the Catholic Church from an admitted position, and soon a predominating position, to complete mastery over all society. All these three phenomena developed together. They occupied about 200 years, roughly from the year 300 to the year 500. When they had run their course, the Western Empire was no longer governed as one society from one imperial center. The chance heads of certain auxiliary forces in the Roman army, drawn from barbaric recruitment, had established themselves in the various provinces and were calling themselves kings. The Catholic Church was everywhere the religion of the great majority. It had everywhere alliance with, and often the use of, the official machinery of government and taxation, which continued unbroken. It had become far beyond all the other organisms in the Roman state, the central and typical organism, which gave the European world its note. This process is commonly called the fall of the Roman Empire. What was that fall? What really happened in this great transformation? The end of section 10. The end of chapter 2.